Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be back. Wednesdays here. It's Hale Bar City Radio, presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and you. Hope you had a good break. I was, I mean, I was just itching and scratching to get back yesterday. I ended up taking mom and grandma to Epley to get them off to Arizona. My fabulous Griswold-esque Arizona vacation did not happen. I got southwested, like many millions or thousands of us. So uh, I'm going to have to figure out another time to to work on my tan and uh, scream at a golf ball. We'll talk a little golf here in about 30 minutes. Mike Shuhart, Wilderness Ridge, going to be with us. Uh, Mike Babcock in about 20 minutes. And in hour two, Andy Markowski, Husker standout. Uh, Evan Bland joins us. And then Dr. Brandon Seifert from Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Uh, a Jock Doc Wednesday and uh, his perspective on Davon Hamlin. Uh, Dr. Brandon and so many folks with uh, uh, with Nebraska Orthopedic are, are on site. Many games, many different sporting events and uh, their perspective on just uh, from from their their eyes uh, when it comes to, to taking care of athletes, of course, uh, a little bit better news on on, on Hamlin with uh, what some are, are saying uh, from his family, that inner circle, Elijah, that um, uh, the healing is is taking place, but it's still a very serious situation. But uh, we were off. We weren't on yesterday, and just it's rocked the the world. Not sports world. It's rocked the world, and uh, we uh, echo so many sentiments with thoughts, prayers, and love towards uh, Davon Hamlin and, and what's going on with his health. It's just it's one of those situations where I think in a modern football world, even just sporting world in general, with all that that innovations there's been in, in safety and rules to, to keep players safe on the field. It was just so shocking to see a situation where there was a player fighting for his life on the field mm-hmm. on national television on Monday Night Football. That's what was so shocking about it. It's just I think we've almost convinced ourselves with all these these different technological innovations. Here's these brand new helmets. Here's these new rules to protect players. Here's all these these health and safety measures that we've put into place for football. You forget at its heart it is still a very, very dangerous sport, and that was shown to the world on Monday night, and I think that's why everyone's thoughts are, are with Hamlin right now, just simply for the fact that we watch this sport, and I think we, we sometimes lose sight of how dangerous it is for the athletes that are down on the field, and that's why they make all that money. That's why there's there's so much attention on these players. It's, a, it's an incredibly dangerous sport, and it takes one moment like that to remind not only football fans everywhere, but just people everywhere how dangerous this sport is that, that, that we idolize these, these gladiators mm. on the field. And whenever it becomes life or death, I, I think everything gets checked back into reality of what's actually going on in the field. Well said. Uh, we'll dive into some recruiting news for Nebraska. A very good day in Orlando yesterday for Nebraska football. Matt Rule getting uh, two more for the class of 2023. Uh, Len Hart, the uh, defensive end, uh, rush, ed, rush end and edge specialist. Ethan Nation, a very talented defensive back. Some thoughts from us as well as Nebraska rounds out their recruiting staff. And We'll get into this with Evan Bland. We'll talk with Babbers as well. But as a a Nebraska fan, let's talk optimism because it's a new year. We're a couple of days late. If you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, your enthusiasm, uh, Larry David, uh, there's a clip that's been going around the last 24 hours where he uh, is in a uh, verbal sparring match with uh, a woman at the gym. He's like, "Why, why are you wishing me happy new year? It's, it's, Two weeks late. There's a there's a length of time. There's a timeline on that. Don't tell me Happy New Year. That was a week ago. We're past Happy New Year, and only as only Larry David can do, just to kind of poke the bear, nitpick a little bit. Well, I, I will say I feel like that that limitation goes until everyone gets back to work for that first day. Sure. And this is our first day back to work. Sure. You and me together. I know it's not the first day back to work for most of America. Sorry, guys. Um, but. 
We bob from from that. We bob busted in yesterday. You and I were both just bouncing off the wall. Well, yeah, because I mean, there was so much good stuff to talk about. With I mean, the the All America game last night, new recruits, new coaching staff. I mean, we have a, a week and a half of content College that we've just been playoffs. sitting on. I mean, yeah. where it's like there's so many places we could go today. That I mean, yeah, it, it's been one of those situations where last week and even beginning of this week, I was like, man, I can't wait to get back and do a show. And then today rolls around, and I went. Eh, maybe vacation wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> Elijah, I, I don't know who got you the uh, the Coors original Yellowstone hat, but I love it. It's corduroy, my brother got it for you for Christmas. The corduroy hats are nice. Yeah. That's, that's throwback. So Nebraska football getting back on the map, getting back into the discussion point where they're playing on New Year's Day. They're playing on that that entree of new year's six or at the very worst you're in a holiday bowl or some of the better later december bowl games you did have a good break didn't you that's where we're starting off today we're going to nebraska's future on january 1st bowls well no i what i mean by that is what's inherited versus what's in the cupboard Okay, that that's what i mean and this kind of spurred me on this morning seeing it over on kfor well, an MSN poll when it comes to, you know, Americans. Uh, a poll was given and uh, answers received. 53% of Americans are excited. They are optimistic about 2023. You're three, four, day, four days into it. It's not gone off the rails yet. So, yeah, I'm still optimistic about it. And and I want to translate that to the football field and, and I honestly think with Nebraska football and, and the work that has already been done on the recruiting trail, where Matt Rule wowed, and you have a, a reality of him and his development, and you have a recruiting class that was hovering 40 to 45. You have a recruiting class that was around 9th or 10th in the Big Ten. And the National on three folks are saying, okay, the way they closed, the people they held on to, retained, flipped, or added, uh, moves Nebraska into top 30. I think 24-7 composite has Nebraska 25th, but it's, it's a solid fourth or fifth in the Big Ten. And what they did in, in this short amount of times, incredible. Now it comes down to... You've got some players. You've also lost some players. Garrett Nelson over the holiday break was tough, but we tip our cap to Garrett Nelson and wish him the best. Uh, you, you tip your cap with Colton Feast and wish him the best, but those are two guys you were hoping would be back or could be back. Uh, but you get players, you keep the players here, and then you develop them. It sounds very simple, but that's not been the case for Nebraska. So we know it's uh, going to be a build I mean, stop me if you've heard this song before, but it's it's a build under rule, and he's done that. But you also have some pretty good retention, right? Quentin Newsom's coming back. Uh, Ty Robinson's coming back. Reimer's coming back. Uh, you have uh, a number. You've you, it looks like you have Casey Thompson back. You have AJ Allen back. You have Grant coming back. You have that whole offensive line that'll have one vision with an offensive coordinator and an offensive line coach and a head coach all on the same page, at least it better be. You have, you have all of those <laughs> variables, and that's getting to the optimistic part of 2023. And with Nebraska, you know, where, where, where can they go? And, and I guess the point here is the starting point is much better for Matt Rule, I would think, than Temple or Baylor. So I don't, and I don't think you do, expect Temple or Baylor year one results. You just can't have it. And, and that's not to stoke um, expectations out of the gate that are unreasonable. But it's just, I think you have too much back despite some transition with an offense, despite uh, a three-three-five defense or whatever it becomes. It's all going to be new to the, rem- the, the remaining players. Okay, so they've got to shift and and get comfortable, and, and you've got to thrive in it in year one. That's a lot to ask. And then you also got to understand the league. I mean, Matt Rule's been very upfront about, all right, how, how are we going to win here? 
what do we have to do to win here? How do you win in the Big Ten? We got to figure out how to do so. Well, it sounds like and looks like you're going to have a uh, a veteran quarterback either in a, a Casey Thompson or a Sims. That's the dual threat element, and I think running the football is going to be a priority for uh, whatever Nebraska is identity wise in 2023 offensively, defensively. A three-three-five or whatever modification turns out to be uh, moving forward post spring, you've seen the three-three-five step up and be problematic on some major stages just in this bull cycle alone. Now, did the quarterback run game eat up TCU in the second half? Absolutely. Was Michigan a blatant mess in the first half with any rhythm or or consistency? Yeah, the, part of that was on Michigan. And part of that was on what TCU did defensively. You look at Illinois. Uh, they uh, took one on the chin horribly uh, with the Pirates and Mississippi State squad in that bad beat. <laughs> <laughs> the, the old bouncer for the cover. But that that's a 3-3-5 defense. So all of this has been swirling in my head as we talk about 2023 and, and the hope springing eternal. Well, and I think the number one reason that I have hope that I mean, in, when we're talking about optimism versus pessimism, I think you have to put it into context. That I'm not sitting here, and I don't think you're sitting here saying, well, we're optimistic that Nebraska is going to go 10-2 and two next season and, and have, have a run at the Big Ten title game. I don't think that's where the optimism is coming from. It's just the optimism that, you know what, Nebraska can live up to the, the preseason expectations behind them, which is this year going to be 6-6 six and six or 7-5. and five. If Nebraska can get to 7-5 and five, year one under Matt Roll, Husker fans will be very happy. They'll be traveling to a bowl game in December for the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. They'll be happy with that. When you look at what Matt Rule has in the cupboard, as you've said, you have multiple guys within this roster that I think have potential to be Big Ten type, all Big Ten type selections, maybe not this year, but in the next couple of years. Uh, and that's just the people that are coming back. When I look at Quentin Newsom, I think he's got potential to be an all Big Ten selection Farmer. next year. Uh, Miles Farmer, Reimer, Reimer, Robinson, Robinson. Um, th- that's four in the defense alone. Then you get to the offense. I think both AJ Allen and Anthony Grant both have all Big Ten potential if they can get an offensive line in front. Just run forward or stay healthy. Exactly and exactly, and I think that's a great two-headed monster at running back. If you can keep both those guys healthy and you can get something of a push along the offensive line, I think both those guys have all Big Ten caliber. I'm not saying first team, but I'm saying all Big Ten caliber. You have some pieces that Matt Rule can work with. You've brought in a recruiting class that I'm not saying you're expecting these freshmen to come in and be key contributors right away, but in a, a realistic, good freshman class, you're going to have guys that step in and get some spot roles early in the year and then maybe work their way into a starting role through injuries, uh, suspensions, what have you. They're going to work their way into a starting role as the year goes on, and, and that would be a successful recruiting class. Mix in some transfer portal pieces, and Nebraska can very realistically get to 7-5. and five. The question is, can they live up to the preseason expectations and the potential that we can see here in January, nine months away from this season? They haven't been able to do it for about four seasons now, but can Matt Rule and new staff bring the best out of these guys that are currently on the roster and develop the guys that are coming in? The fact is, is they've had enough here to be six and six, seven and five, eight and four for a lot of years in a row. And they've ended up mm-hmm. topping out at three and nine, five and seven, four and eight. Hence the change. Do you have the right guy in place now that takes what you have and brings in what you need and and finally flips it? Uh, Brennan uh, chimes in. Good to talk with you again, Brennan. And you're welcome to find us on different platforms here, Facebook and Twitter with ESPN Lincoln. Also, Hail Varsity Radio's Twitter handle at HVarsity Radio. And then watch us, stream us as well live on the Hail Varsity YouTube channel. And I don't disagree here with, uh, with Brennan. Uh, his take here, if you have a Temple or Baylor year one start, I think you lose the fan base really quickly because your starting point, think about the dreaded board game maybe you played over the holiday break. Right? Do you play Monopoly? Ah, okay. Okay, you're just, you're leaving it open-ended, whichever board game whichever it is. Whichever board game. I thought game, you had a specific one in mind. I'm no, like, I haven't played a board game for a thousand years. And oh, you're missing just out. Me. No, you're missing I, out. I'm quite okay. I'll play pitch. I won't play board games. Didn't Settlers of Catan. Huh? Settlers of Catan? Never. Oh, no you would love it. We should no, play it sometime. No, uh, maybe. But the point is, is you've got a different starting point. You, you'd like to think with, well, clearly, uh, just <laughs> from, what, from what Baylor was going through to what Nebraska is. And Nebraska right now just needs to be, A, keep guys in the program and coach them up. Get them better. 
right? It, it sounds way simple. Uh, that's um, that's kind of my take here. Mike Babcock's on the way. Quickly, Husker basketball. Elijah, you know, the first uh, four minutes, okay. The second four minutes, all right. The final 12, no good. A seven-minute scoring drop for Nebraska. Uh, we'll get more into basketball in less than an hour, a little more than an hour, excuse me, with uh, Andy Markowski. But Nebraska just let their their defense affect make it let their offense affect their their defense. Uh, and Michigan State was just a clinic last night with their ball movement. Uh, it was pretty difficult to watch as Sparty just smoked Nebraska in that first half. Love Nebraska's effort in the second half, but it was uh, it was an uphill climb. Michigan State was really ready. Had a chance to talk with our dear friend Jack Ebling, uh, Ebling Media, a radio and uh, and of course uh, uh, content producer with uh, Matt, with uh, his uh, his own uh, newspaper notoriety, Jack Ebling, a uh, man we met in Charlotte uh, over the summer. And he's uh, all in with with Izzo and and Sparty and talked with him yesterday. Sparty was really worried about Nebraska. They prepped like it. They trained like it. And they had all the answers Nebraska needs. They got to have Minnesota on Saturday. Mike Babcock's next to Tale Varsity presented by Currency. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. Thanks for hanging out. It's Hale Bar City Radio. Get the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and, of course, the uh, segments chopped up for you or the full show. Easy for you to take with. Uh, historian, author, Hall of Famer, Mr. Husker Football, and all things Nebraska, Mike Babcock with us at MD Babs on Twitter. Babbers, how'd you bring in the new year? Um, sat around and watched TV. You watch the bowl games just like me, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's about the extent of it, right there. Hey, no worries. Yeah, I was at a uh, I was at a wedding and had about ten people packed around my phone uh, until my phone. So you were the guy that brought his. his oh yeah, oh, of course. I wasn't going to miss these games, dude. But no, then I mean, I just, I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going over to St. Nick's house. We're boiling crab legs. We're throwing steak on the grill. We're watching football. It was great. That sounds too bad. What, what was bad about mine was uh, about midway through the third quarter of that Ohio State Georgia game, my phone tips over off the table, cracks my phone screen. Bad. I still watched the game though. Watched it through the cracks. Caught the ending. It was a great game. Yeah, it was a lot of it, Mike. Thoughts? We'll start there with the Big Ten and their uh, dubious performance. First time in ever uh, they got two in and uh, two great ball games, two memorable ball games, uh, albeit some controversial. But the, the Big Ten two in barbecue. Yeah, well, I mean it. It's that time of year, I guess, and the fact that they got in is a reflection of what they accomplished. And I mean, you, you know, that Georgia team is is pretty remarkable. I think. Uh, I felt bad about the missed field goal there just because, you know, I hate to have one guy, you know, it, it's not just one guy. It's everything that happened in the game, obviously, but it comes down to that one play and he misses the field goal. I felt bad about that for him, for the individual, but uh, I got to give Georgia credit uh, for the way it played and, and uh, TCU, you know, I'm real, I'm going to be interested to see how TCU holds up against Georgia. Um, at, you know, Sonny Dykes has done a remarkable job, I think, with with uh, TCU. It's too bad that uh, they didn't beat Kansas State in the in the champion in the conference championship game, um, because then we would have uh, two undefeated teams. Which, you know, that it, it's almost like that's what you have, but you, but you don't because they they lost that game to Kansas State. So I, I you know I think it'll be interesting. But I, I still think that Georgia has is, is probably got the edge. No, I totally agree with you there. I'm just wondering, <laughs> is it is it just a, is it a blowout? Is it close? I think the effort will be incredible by TCU. Do they have enough horses? Uh, I think uh, Max Duggan, we're all kind of rooting for him because of his locale and, and where he grew up uh, just across the river. And, you know, could have, would have, should have, maybe in a, you know, a Nebraska get in, in – different times as we hover in on recruiting uh, with the Under Armour announcements yesterday that went pro Nebraska. But Mike, we, we started off with this a little bit ago and I want to get your take. 
with uh, the, the year and the expectations with year one a rule. Uh, and honestly, do you think rules starting point, how, how would you compare it to past new coaches? Because we've had a thousand to choose from. Do you think it's as good as it's a good as it as good a situation as there has been for a, for a first year guy to come in? Well, I don't know. I'm I'm gonna respond by asking you a question. Sure. I mean, don't you think that people are a little hesitant now because of what you just said? The number of coaches that have come in here. Right. This is action. this is the answer, though. I'm kidding. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you, you pray it's the answer, but no. I mean, think about it. You go all the way back nine and four for Frank. Uh, five and six for Billy C. Uh, Bo had a great first year. They got better. They yeah. got better in uh, in two thousand eight and went nine and four. Uh, Riles went five and seven, but I think that was a ten win football team. And then uh, from Riles to Scott, they uh, much like his tenure, want some of those back because there were so many close ball games. So, yeah, I think with with what you have coming back, and with what your uh, your starting point is, I think you can be pretty optimistic. And, and Elijah and I aren't screaming, "Well, let's go get nine. But I'm saying, based on looking at the schedule and assuming you don't have a whole bunch of attrition, because that's been a key component in Nebraska's shortcomings. You've not had kids stick around to get developed. Yeah, well, and. You know, from what I see, um, and, I, and I always say, you know, wait till the, the student athlete gets here and let's see how he performs um, before we get too carried away, whether he's got three stars or four stars or, you know, no stars, whatever. Um, and so from that standpoint, I remain open to what might happen. But the thing that has impressed me is – the aggressiveness that Matt Rule and his staff have have shown in their recruiting approach, what they've done, and in this time of uh, social media, how they've taken advantage of that. Mike Babcock's with us here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And Mike, let, let's move to the news from yesterday. Ethan Nation and Cam Linhart both committing at the Under Armour All-America game, which it was, uh, was nice to see after a, a few years of uh, Nebraska missing on a lot of those guys announcing on national television. Linhart's a guy who's already been in the boat. As for Nation, he's a guy who had something like 50 different offers as a three-star player, which uh, I guess you can read into to what you will about him being a three-star despite having offers from the likes of Alabama. Yet he, he's in the boat as well. Nebraska going defensive heavy, at least with this late signing period. And I think you could argue from the uh, the early signing period as well. What does that tell you about what Matt Rule thinks he has offensively? Is it a case of going and getting the guys that he thinks uh, are most attainable? Or does he think that there needs to be more defensive changes to try to fit this Nebraska defense into a 3-3-5? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, he probably knew a little sooner than maybe we knew that Garrett Nelson wasn't going to come back and that Colton Feast wasn't going to come back. Um, and so you had you you've got some significant uh, people to replace on defense. You know that's one of the things. Um, I think it's I think it was it's great for Nebraska that these that these uh, uh, recruits make this announcement on TV. You know that that speaks well for the for the program that you know to get the name out there. Um, you know oh Nebraska got a couple of these guys. Uh, kind of a thing. And and again, I go back to what I said was the aggressiveness of Matt Rule and his staff in the, in the recruiting process. And, you know, I'll underscore this with his comment, uh, you know, at, at the introductory press conference, that it's about development, developmental. So if, you know, if it's a, if it's a three-star recruit that's been aggressively recruited by 50 schools or whatever big name uh, schools, um, bring them in and put them in a position to develop them because you still have to get these guys to mesh um, with the guys that are returning and with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought that the, uh, the comment about development, the emphasis on development, that's important. That's going to reflect, you know, what's going to happen this season. You know, what you can expect is how quickly they can develop these guys 
and mesh, get the, get the new guys in. Mike, uh, I want to go to basket, basketball right now and switch gears a little bit. Uh, feel on last night's performance with Nebraska, not what they wanted. Uh, Sparty is really pretty good. I think you're, you're looking at a top three team in the Big Ten and anywhere from a three to a five seed if, if they keep going the direction they're supposed to go. Uh, Fred wasn't happy, wasn't happy with the first half, wasn't happy with the start. Yeah, well, I, you know, the thing that has impressed me from game to game is the grittiness of the team and, the you know, how aggressive they are on defense. I think that's important. Um, the shooting was not what you'd want it to be. The free throw shooting was not what you wanted it to be. And it seems like there's this kind of up and down thing where that, you know, it happens one game. They put it together against Iowa, definitely put it together against Iowa. Um, then they didn't get it put together against Michigan State. But you made the comment earlier about Michigan State knew what to expect with Nebraska and prepared hard for that. Um, I think that says a lot about what, where the Huskers are in terms of the respect that they have. And, and I think they're going to, you know, they're going to be nice. It's going to be up and down. They're going to be nights where you're going to look at it and say, well, they just didn't get it done. Um, but uh, I think they're also going to be nights like the Iowa game where, where you're going to be impressed because they're because of that grit on defense, especially. And it seems like when they play the best offensively, it's when they move the ball around, when it doesn't just come down and one guy takes a shot and off they go to the other end. Um, that's the thing that, that you have to do is move that ball. And, uh, and if you can do that and take the open shot rather than the first shot that you get, um, you're going to be in a position where you can be successful, I think. Mike, the theme of the year for Husker basketball has been defending the home floor. Only one loss this year on the home floor. I was to Purdue in a game that went to overtime, a very close game. Uh, everything, everything else at home has been a win. As for the road, it's been a struggle for Nebraska basketball, and they've played some tough teams on the road. But if Nebraska's continued uh, to be able to defend the home floor, have a good home record, and, and the, the road struggles continue, will Husker fans be happy with that at the end of the year? Well, um, gosh, that's a good question because I don't know what the expectations were. I think the expectations were that you'd have some success on the road too. You know, that it wasn't going to just be a home court thing. But, you know, if you can at least be successful at home, um, that's a place to start, right? I mean, that's, that's, that gives you some hope then when you do go on the road that, hey, if you're, if you're maintaining control of your home court and you go on the road, You've got to, you've built some confidence and you have an opportunity to, to, to be successful on the road. Um, it's kind of like my Golden State Warriors. They win at home and they lose on the road. Mm-hmm. Mike, about a minute here. What's uh, the latest with Hale Varsity Magazine, HaleVarsity.com? Well, we're planning out the next issue, actually. We're, we're just getting started in, in, the, in the planning stages of, of what we want to do. Um, we met yesterday. Um, we talked about some possible feature issues. Uh, emphasis on feature stories and we'll make a decision next next Tuesday when we have a staff meeting um, where we're going to focus but uh, yeah there's a it's a good staff and people have good ideas about what to do it's just a question of where you want to place it and where you when when you want to run those stories I guess is what I'm saying well, can't wait for it. Mike Babcock, give him a follow on Twitter at MD Babs. Read him with Hale Varsity Magazine, HaleVarsity.com. Can get signed up for the magazine and the digital content. HaleVarsity.com backslash offer is where you go, keeping uh, in tune with uh, signing day and uh, that second signing day that's going to be in February. Babbers, you take care, and uh, thanks for making time today. Thanks for having me, and I do believe you can still say Happy New Year. (laughs) And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out, Hale Varsity Radio. Back for the new year. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Find us on Twitter, at Schmidt underscore radio, or at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Tweet of the day, and it's... Well, it's not so nice, but it's kind of funny. Uh, this uh, from a uh, anti-Bobby Petrino person. Bobby Petrino leaving UNLV 20 days after he was hired to go to 
Texas A&M, this dude has abandoned more kids than Sean Kemp. Oh. Whew. Whew. If you're counting at home, Jimbo is fired, or make it hired. Bobby Petrino and DJ Durkin mm-hmm. of Maryland fame is his defensive coordinator. A man that's much nicer uh, when it comes to coaching and uh, development, uh, Mike Shuhart, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Shuey, it's uh, a little chilly today, but you know what? Uh, I'm sure the uh, the scenery looks beautiful at Wilderness here for 2023. How you doing, man? I'm doing awesome. I'm doing great. I put out some nasty tweets, but never one was quite that nasty. <laughs> Here's, I love it. And I get, you know, I follow Shuey on Twitter, and Shuey's the ultimate, I mean, the only thing that's not there is a, a selfie of him in big red face paint. Because you love you some Husker football, you love Husker basketball, you love Husker baseball, and of course Husker golf. And yeah, Shuey, you have a uh, you you've you've been very very patient. You're a big time fan. You grew up with it, but you, my friend, like many Nebraska fans over the last several years, you've had your breaking point time and time again. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It can only take so much. Then it's like <laughs> then it boils over a little bit. So. Mm-hmm. I've had a few of those moments. Well, uh, let's let's talk about the here and now, keeping with the optimism theme. Do you think uh, this year will will end the the dubious streak for Nebraska? We're just going to blindly say Matt Rule recruiting, Matt Rule history, Matt Rule staff, Matt Rule development, Matt Rule inheritance. The kids that are coming back equals what for twenty twenty three. I think 2023 needs to be still patient, very patient. But I've never been more optimistic about it since the Osborne eras, you know. So it's like just, I mean, I, I, I love me some Nebraska sports. And uh, I took the time to sit him, listen to all the interviews I took with all the assistant coaches, and I've never been more impressed listening to them, just how they talk, um, their mission, uh, what it is they're trying to accomplish, how they're it, how they're going to go about accomplishing it. So it was it was very refreshing um, to listen to that. Very, all of them very articulate, very professional. Um, that to me is the most refreshing part, and their understanding of what it is. Um, at least listening to them talk, it's like Nebraska is this. This is what it's supposed to be, and their mission is to get it back you know, to what it is supposed to be. I mean, that's what people grew up. That's what people know. That's what people have become accustomed to. I mean, it's an incredible brand. Um, And it's, and it it sounds like they realize that and they understand the importance of what it means and what it is. And uh, I I mean, like I said, I'm I'm super optimistic about uh, the direction that's going to go and where it will eventually be. I mean, we'll be good. Will we Win national titles, I don't know. That's a pretty tough task to do. It's mm-hmm. an incredibly different environment from the 90s. But will they be competitive? You know, uh, I believe so. Mike Schwartz with us here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. Mike joining us from Wilderness Ridge. And, Mike, I got to get your reaction. A 23, just about 24-year-old full-time wide receivers coach would you be hiring 23 slash 24 year olds to be position coaches if you were in Matt Rule's position, or are you just going to let Matt Rule do what Matt Rule's going to do and put your trust in him? You're going to let Matt Rule. <laughs> hey, that was good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to trust in what he sees and what he believes. And I'm, I mean, age just it's it's nothing. Obviously, there's something to be said for experience. You know, the only way you gain experience is you have to experience it. You know, so it's like. The 24-year-old dude probably hasn't been around that much, but at the same time, you know, listening to him talk about him and other people talking about him, I mean, he's a very intelligent, you know, up-and-comer type of a guy, and it seems like a lot of the guys on the staff are that, you know, and it's like I've always been a big believer in that you, you hire the best that you can get your hands on, and some of that means that, you have to forecast a little bit on what you think that person has the capabilities of becoming, you know, if you believe in them that much that they will not only be good now, but they'll even be better 
you know, as time goes on. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge believer in giving people that I believe have those type of attributes and abilities that, you know, they're only going to get better and they're only going to help me along the way as they continue to get better. Chewy, uh, let's talk a little bit here while we got you. It's been forever and a day, man. We had the, er- had the early signing day uh, last time we were on before the, the holiday break. A thought from you, my friend, on just how Nebraska's wrapped up. I know you keep uh, an eye on recruiting. Yeah, pretty amazing. I mean, what they did in a short period of time, getting some of the players that they've gotten. Um, one of the things that's really encouraging, too, is uh, keeping basically the whole class that had already committed and then guys that had decommitted, getting them to either commit. A few guys went in the portal, came back. Yeah, they lost some, but you're going to do that with today's environment. But for the most part, I mean, it was they kept the class intact, um, like the kid yesterday um, who committed, decommitted, then he committed back. You know, that, that to me says a lot for – the staff and what they're doing and what they're telling these kids, you know, and getting them excited about, uh, you know, coming to Nebraska and being a Cornhusker. Chewy, are, are you in? We're putting a party bus together for Boulder. Man, that's going to be a crazy yeah, Jay Moore is the muscle. Babcock's renting a, a tank. We're going to go crash at Barney's house. Coach Barnett, are you in? Elijah's writing yeah. shotgun. I've got the cooler. As long as Jay's there, man, he's a big dude. I'll, I'll sneak it behind him. <laughs> you, you're going to bring a wedge just as protection, aren't you? <laughs> I can whack a few people in the ankles. I'm not known for that. <laughs> it's all right. Well, if you, you you could probably fashion a wedge into a shank as well if really needed. <laughs> Shuey's got his shop. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't kid yourself. <laughs> There's a whole line of shoe heart putters that can be shaped into sharp objects, right, <laughs> Shuey? <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a crazy environment out there. It'll be pretty fun. He avoided the question there. He avoided the question there completely about I'm whether or not he's he is- got he's got a, he's got some commemorative ones that that he kept he held back because Shuey, there is a shoe heart putter, correct? There is. Yeah, there is. Okay, I need to get one of those because uh, clearly it helps, uh, and I need all the help on the short game in twenty twenty three. Shuey, about ten seconds. What's happening with you at Wilderness here? Just kind of uh, wrapped up twenty twenty two, and now we're kind of sitting and putting things to paper and getting things ready for twenty twenty three. Yeah, looking for a fantastic year. It's going to be an awesome year. We're excited. You know, like I said, most of our um, new things we have going on will will come online and be ready for 2023. So um, I can't wait for our members to see all that, that, that they've done and, and what's available to them. So it's going to be a fun year. Chewy, we appreciate you. We'll talk next week, bud. All right. Thanks for having me. Stay safe. Chime in 402 466 ESPN or email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time, hour two. Evan Bland going to be with us, Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. And uh, we'll spend time with him, his take on Mr. Hamlin, and uh, just being. Dr. Brandon's done so much work in his career and so many of the great docs at uh, Nebraska Orthopedic Center when it comes to being on site at sporting events uh, with when, when injuries happen. Uh, of course, uh, Davon is uh, still in so many people's thoughts and prayers, and, and we keep that uh, in the forefront. Reminder to get buckled up. If you do this, things can happen in the positive light. That's hands on the wheel, eyes and mind straight ahead. The driver, one job, that's to drive this message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. So uh, it's just going to be fascinating to see college football grow. And there's some of you that have been just the four team. There are many of you that love the 12 team that's going to happen and over the, the weekend of games where you had what would have been playoff games, the finishes with Tulane and USC. 
And the reason we're getting to this now is because this is the first day we're on the air in 2023. So forgive us for uh, maybe being a day late on it. Also, the Penn State-Utah game. I mean, there's been some some awesome finishes this year. Kansas, their overtime marathon where they almost pulled it off. And, of course, Texas Tech. Uh, I, 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 there's been a handful of really, really incredible bowl games. There's been some so-so ones. And I don't know if, if the end of this 2022 season will, will match or deliver with what the, the, the four team gave us drama last second moments uh, nebraska fans and ptsd with the byron bennett kick 30 years ago in reference to what didn't happen for ohio state just the the officiating uh with the inconsistency of targeting the outrage on social media with what was or wasn't called targeting just the, the mess michigan was in the first half did themselves in to their credit they roared back you had 50 points in about a six minute window and and now that the question is this it's, it's harbaugh watch again it's harbaugh watch 2023 what's funny is i put elijah to sleep is what the big 10 conference has been and, and that has been a league of incredible coaches and staffs to okay is ryan day long for this world between college to the NFL. Is is Harbaugh going to finally get that offer and make a jump? Hopefully it's not to the Broncos. You don't want him? No. Have you seen the track record of college coaches going off to the NFL? It's terrible. But he's the exception. He could be. Him and Carroll. Pete Carroll. Could be. No, he's, he's been to a Super Bowl. Or has he found his, has he found his niche in college football? Though? Maybe he's, he's found he's his gonna, place. He's going to go either to Indy or to Carolina yeah. if, if, if he goes. Denver's too screwed. <laughs> That's I mean, a great he, point. You just are. I think the Broncos should go look at D'Amico Ryans. But back to Harbaugh. I think he's he, found his niche. I, I, I think, think he's found his spot. Why, why screw up a good thing? They're paying you good money to stay at Michigan. Because he wants a Super Bowl. Go win a national championship first. Well, go, go, go cross that hurdle first, Jim. His bull record's been highlighted. Uh, if things proceed, we'll reach out to our Michigan people and go there. But, you know, the rule could be uh, uh, one of the taller standing coaches here moving forward. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Into Hour 2 at Tail Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Basketball on our mind. We'll get to some Nebraska football, too, with Evan Bland in about 30 minutes. The pride of Ord with us, standout Husker and uh, proud Papa as well when it comes to the, uh, the the women's basketball scene. Andy Markowski with us at Markowski underscore Andy. Happy New Year, Andy. How we doing? Uh, same to you guys. No, it's a good start. Hoops is in, in full go. No snow on the ground. So uh, all is good, Chris. That is the, the key word. Uh, no snow. A couple, couple of words. No snow. But a uh, bit of an avalanche the first five uh, to ten minutes for Nebraska. I should say the second ten for the roadie, the Michigan State, Andy. Let's start there. What were you hoping for last night? What were you expecting last night? Well, I, you know, I, I thought it was a game that we could go and, and be competitive. And Michigan State had, you know, showing some vulnerabilities of, of not playing great offensively, had, had really struggled to score. Uh, so I thought it was a game that we could stay, you know, attached and, and you know, hopefully make some plays to win. And unfortunately, uh, Michigan State was, was really good. I, I thought it was the first team that matched our our physicality on the backboard. You know, they wouldn't let Greasel post. Uh, I, I thought they're – Big to little pin down screens uh, was was effective. They were you know able to get open shots, which they made a lot of uh, shots early, which certainly helps your your energy level. And then we never helped ourselves. I and mean, if you look at the amount of shots we missed around the rim late in that first half, to so maybe you know, instead of being down twenty, could you be down twelve? You know, I think we we're two of. 
16 from the three, and we finished 8 of 20 from the free throw line. So, you know, we didn't do the necessary things to make that game more competitive. But, you know, I, I still think we fought. We had a chance to get it to, you know, to 12 to 10 at, at one point in the second half. You never know what could happen if you start putting game pressure on. But I, I thought Michigan State was, was the better team. I thought they played really well. Uh, they shot the ball well. And, you know, if, if you're going to make shots at home uh, in the Big Ten, you're going to be tough to beat. Andy Markowski is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Andy, what do you make of Sam Greasel's night last night? He didn't have the night distributing that you might expect from only two assists from Greasel on the night, and that just seems so out of character for what we've seen from him so far this season. What did you make of that? Was that something Michigan State was doing defensively, or is this just a case of Nebraska and maybe Greasel being off? Well, in order to get assists, you have to have a teammate make a shot or make a layup. So, you know, I, I think some of that was – you know, uh, assists could be affected by the poor play of, uh, of teammates. So I didn't think really anybody played great last night. I, I, I thought uh, they neutralized, you know, Walker in the lane. I, I didn't think our two guards were able to free themselves and, and get shots. I thought Gary's physicality was bad. So, you know, I, I just give credit to, to Michigan State. I, I, I think they're at home. They played with good energy. And, um, you know, uh, Sam's, Sam's been a great addition. Um, you know, Sam's not a great – Offensive player. He's a he's a you know 23 year old that that knows you know how to play the game. Uh, you know he's you know able to, to make open threes occasionally. You know he, he gets himself to the free throw line. He can post. He's probably not a natural point guard, even though he's you know he, he can play the position. He's unselfish, but you know to, to put a lot on his back to go on the road and 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 be uh, you know the best player on the court. I, I don't I don't think that's Sam. I think sometimes people expect a little bit more than what Sam's able. But what he has brought this team is the toughness and the confidence and, and just the versatility of, of where Fred is, is putting him on offense. Uh, in addition to Walker, those two have been hard to match up to. And you know, I think that's where his most value has been is just the fact that he can post and they can play offense through him there. Andy, uh, what's next for Nebraska is Minnesota. They scared uh, – Put a big scare into Wisconsin. Chucky Hepburn did Chucky Hepburn things. That steal at the end was yeah. so clutch. Yeah, and, and that's wow. that's what he does. And that so that was a scare. But is this uh, is this a turning point ball game this early in the year for Nebraska? Knowing where they're at in conference, they've won on the road. They've been great at home, aside from just you know getting their hearts broke against Purdue. They got to have Saturday, don't they? Well, yeah. If, if you you know, if if you're trying to play for a postseason, right? Let's just say that NIT is in play for for this game. You know, I, I think we can all agree that NCAA tournament would, would would be a pretty good stretch, even though they good enough to beat NCAA tournament teams. I don't know if they're consistent enough to to have that resume. But I think the NIT is is in play for this group. Um, and if that's the case, then you know, there's only so many places that you might be as good as the team that you're playing on the road. And I think Minnesota. It's probably a team that, that we're better than on, on paper. They struggled. They're 0-3 in the league. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a game that they need to win and they you know, have a chance to come home and play against uh, uh, an Illinois team that hasn't won a league game. So, you know, it's a chance to get a little bit of momentum. Um, but, you know, if, if you want to be a postseason team, if, if you want to build you know, on the momentum that you've created with, uh, you know, a good home win against Iowa, you know, you need to go – into the back half of the Big Ten, you know, or the bottom half of the Big Ten and, and find ways to steal a couple of those road games. Yeah, you mentioned road games and, and stealing them. It's, it's been a real struggle for Nebraska basketball so far this season, and there's a multitude of factors from, I mean, the fans being a paramount, the fact that basketball is a game of runs and, and fans help with momentum, but also different backdrops while you're shooting can kind of change the perspective of, of where you're at on the floor. And Nebraska just hasn't felt like it's had a good shooting night on the road so far this season. And I want to get your take, Andy, on what that can be attributed to. Nebraska's played some tough teams on the road, so that could be a part of it, but they also haven't looked their best when they're on the road. So, so what's your take on Nebraska's road struggles? Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly, you know, going on the road is, is different, right? There's there's variables that, that make you uncomfortable, and when you're not comfortable, you you, you don't play your best. And, you know, this, this group is a veteran group. I, I think they're capable of of, of going on the road and winning. Uh, you know, they, they win a different style. You know, are they going to go on the road and make, you know, 13 threes and, and win that way? I, I, I don't think I'm, this team's going to win that way. So, you know, there, there's other other things you can do. Um, you know, you can defend, you can create energy, 
uh, by you know by getting stops, you can feed off of that energy. Um, you know, if you're a really tough, cohesive group, and you know, you you made the point. I I think some of those early road struggles. Uh, you know, part of it was not having their roster assembled with with uh, you know Walker having you know been out for six games. Um, but you know, they're going to play ten, <clears throat> ten <clears throat> excuse me ten road games in the Big Ten. You know, certainly Indiana uh, did not go well. They didn't play well at Michigan State. So you know, I, I think Minnesota is a is a place that uh, is a hard place to play. The barn is, uh, you know, it's a unique arena uh, in terms of being up on a stage. It, it's different. The, the sight lines are different. Uh, but in the end, uh, you know, they, they just have to play better. They've got to make free throws. They've got to make layups. Uh, defensively, they have to be better than they were uh, against Michigan State. And, you know, fortunately for those Minnesota's players aren't as good as Michigan State's players. So, so hopefully that will help them uh, get off to a better start and find a way to stay close and, and, and win a tight game late, because that's typically how you get a win in the Big Ten on the road. Andy, this team, and I saw the stat from, from Bardo last night that the Nebraska from distance is uh, right at the bottom, uh, three-point percentage. Can this team get better? I mean, I look at a guy like Wiltshire and, and Tominaga specifically as, as guys that are supposed to be three-point artists, and it's been pretty rare that both have been on at the same time. Uh, aside from Walker and Greasel, the, the, the other starting three really struggled 5 of 21 from the floor. Now, uh, that can happen, but, but typically you'll, you'll bring it defensively. In more instances than not, Nebraska's defense has been, been rock solid. It wasn't up to Fred's liking uh, in that first half for his post game, but is Nebraska are they are what they are, or do you do you think the team can find a groove and get better? You tell me. You've lived that life in Division One in major conference play. Can you get hot, find the stroke, so to speak, and 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 help this offense out from from deep, or is Nebraska just going to be a hot and cold three point shooting team? Well, I, I think they can uh, you know play better, uh, you know, and, and shooting might not. Be the reason why they play better. You know, you look at Wiltshire and and Tobinaga, they're, they're basically going one for one for each other. You know, you very seldom will, will play in both just because defensively, uh, you know, that's not what Fred's doing. But to your to your point, you know, teams know that they're a best shooter, and then you know, I think some of the shots they're getting lately have been been hard shots. I mean, teams aren't aren't letting them just catch in rhythm and shoot. And you know, you look at Gary and and, and Greasel, both are capable of making a three, but but teams are allowing them to to, to take. You know, contested threes um, just because they're they're not shooting. You know, I think Vandemel is is a kid that I think can shoot better than, than maybe what he's done, and it's him taking the right shots. Um, you know, I thought Wilhelm is, is you know Fred's trying to find ways to, to play him uh, at the four. That way he can play Walker and, and Wilhelm together. I think Wilhelm shoots a, a little bit better than Gary, um, so maybe we can stretch teams at the at the four a little bit. But but part of that is. Wilhelm's got to have somebody he can defend at the four. Uh, teams are playing more, you know, smaller and more athletic at the four, which means you have to go back to Gary. So, you know, it, it, it is a it is a bouncing act in terms of what what Fred is going to do. But you know, in the end, uh, he's got long, active, good defenders and and average shooters. And if Wiltshire and Tobinaga can't kick good threes, you know, they're not going to beat teams from the three point line. So they're going to have to find other ways to to score and get fouled. And you know, they got to the free throw line twenty times against Michigan State, against an Izzo team, that's pretty good. But you made eight of them. Like, you know, that, that should be 16 <laughs> out of 20. Um, you know, so they didn't help themselves in, in some of those areas that if they can, you know, they can shore up free throw shooting and, and shoot from the three a little bit better and, and keep rebounding and, and, and find a ways that the score with Grusel Walker, you know, they're good enough to, to go and win seven, eight games in the league. If they, if they really struggle scoring like they did last night, you know, you're probably looking at five conference wins. So, you know, they, they're going to have to find a way to, to put the ball in the basket more effectively. Andy, the best league right now is is who? Yeah, are you going Big 12? Are you ACC, SEC, Big 10? Who's got your attention? Uh, it, it is really balanced. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, all leagues have a couple really good teams. I mean, I look, I look at the Big 12. You know, I think Kansas is back to – to being one, uh, you know, the ACC isn't going anywhere. I know North Carolina and, and, and Duke have, have struggled a little bit, but the depths, you look at the, the SEC, I, I think it you know, might be down a little bit with Kentucky being not great, but, you know, then you look at Alabama and a, 
in Tennessee and a, and a few of those other schools that maybe five years ago weren't at Minshew now are, are powerhouse. I, I don't think the the Big Ten is is as good on the top as as it's been in years past. However, if you were to ask me, you know, how many Big Ten teams can make the NCAA tournament, I think eleven are still in play to make the NCAA tournament. So the, the depth of the – now 11 is not going to make it, but mm-hmm. I, I think 11 have, have still positioned themselves to have a chance. So that speaks to just the depth of, of good teams in the Big Ten. So, you know, uh, January is always a hard month. I think it's a month where, where, where teams start to separate themselves. Some teams will start playing really well. You know, I think injuries hit you in January. The teams that are deep can, can overcome that. So – you know, we'll know a lot more by the end of January, and you know certainly February into the conference tournaments will be fun to watch. And you got about two minutes here. A thought on the Husker women, uh, tough one in OT against uh, Indiana. Great effort on the road against the top ten. Great win against Kansas. Michigan was tough, and Rutgers Saturday uh, for the Husker women. Yeah, certainly. You know, uh, losing at home to Michigan uh, was tough. I mean, you know, we beat Michigan twice last year in two pretty uh, anticipated games. I thought mentally uh, they had the edge over us. And then, you know, to your point, we had a chance to get number three Indiana on the road. Uh, you know, our ball with 30 seconds holding the last shot. I mean, that's a game that you need to win in regulation. Once it got into overtime, I thought that was going to be hard for, for for Nebraska to win it. But you know, they're playing better. I um, mean, obviously losing Allison Widener. Uh, for the season is going to hurt, but Sam Hybe is, is, is back and, and you know contributing at the uh, close to the level that she was a year ago. And you know it's it's like the men's league. There's uh, I think five teams ranked, uh, five or four are in the top twelve in the in the country. Um, you know you're going to Rutgers, which isn't a great team on paper, but they just played um, you know Maryland to ten points the other night. So it's a great conference. Nebraska got the you know, the women have to stay together, keep playing well, and, you know, hopefully they can find a, a way to protect the home courts and uh, win a couple on the road. And, and, you know, I think they're still positioned for the in-state tournament. I think they're an eighth seed right now in the bracketology. Um, so, you know, hopefully they can, uh, you know, finish strong here. Last thought, Andy, Pius girls at 7-1. and one. Uh, You happy heading into uh, January? Yeah, we, uh, you know, tripped up and, and got beat by a good Lincoln Northeast team in the semis of the hack. Um you know the hack uh, on the on the top end is pretty good with with Lincoln High, Northeast, Kearney, Southwest. Um, so yeah, it's uh, Class A is very balanced, very deep, and uh, yeah, I think our girls are hanging in there. But a lot of tough games left to play. Andy, I know we said last up. I got one more quick one for you. You were in attendance for that game against Indiana on Saturday, right? Or Sunday, excuse me. I was. Yeah, we uh, we finished the hack at at four, and my wife and I drove overnight to get the. Get to oh, Bloomington wow. to have a chance. I'd never been there before, so it was one of the things I wanted to, one of the arenas I wanted to get to. See, I, I knew you were there, Andy, because uh, I'm not sure who you're paying off with ESPN, but you just kept on getting on TV on Sunday. Or, yeah, Sunday. They, won't, they won't leave me alone. I just want to sit and watch and uh, maybe yell at the officials a little bit. I, I did happen to yell at Alexis on her second foul 80 feet from the basket. I was not very happy, so hopefully <laughs> they didn't have a uh, have me on camera there because uh, they might have heard a couple <laughs> vulgar words because, uh, you know, that, that back-to-back game, she found herself uh, in foul trouble and, you know, just things that uh, she knows better than. So, yeah, they, I wish they would just leave me out of it and let me sit and watch and uh, nobody wants to look at my uh, – Old uh, overweight butt. So the, uh, uh, anyway, the we, uh, the, the you know, Markowski it's, it's, cam. It's a cool story. <laughs> <laughs> it's like thirty seconds left. Crunch time. No, there's Andy Markowski. There's Andy Markowski. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy, we'll check in again. Thanks for the time, bud. Appreciate you. All right, sounds good, guys. Thanks. Evan Bland on the way with Hale Varsity. Chime in 402-466 ESPN or email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, Tail Varsity Radio. Great to be back and spend time with Evan Bland of the Omaha World Herald. Talks from Nebraska football. Evan, uh, good to spend uh, a few minutes here and Nebraska closing out 2023 with uh, a big old smile at the Under Armour All-American game in Orlando, man. They did. They kind of stole the show. Two commitments with uh, Ethan Nation and, and Cam Lenhart, who, of course, had been previously committed. But, you know, anytime you can sort of have your, have your program come up multiple times on national television in a game that showcases 
talent, uh, you know, from all the major programs around the country, uh, that's a good day. And, and I think anyone who follows Nebraska recruiting for any amount of time can recall instances where some of those uh, televised signing moments have not gone their way, or, or maybe it just uh, is sort of flamed out. Um, so in this case, they, they get a couple of guys who have some pretty big offers elsewhere. Uh, Lenhart's the guy that they wanted. You look at some of the schools that were after Ethan Nation. It's it's pretty impressive, even though he's uh, you know in the industry a three star prospect. So strong finish. Obviously, those guys had signed last month, and and and, they, and Nebraska was able to make that official uh, later in the day yesterday. But um, yeah, absolutely a strong finish puts them at. 30, 30 uh, high schoolers, JUCOs, transfers to this point. I'm sure they're not done adding, um, but absolutely a strong finish as they start the new year. When you look at, at Len Hart, I mean, Nebraska has some variety, don't they, with that edge position? I think uh, Len Hart's versatility, obviously, get after the quarterback, put your hand in the dirt, but Evan, he's a guy that can drop into coverage, too. Right. I mean, and that's the name of the game in, in some of these defenses now. And you look especially with the 3-3-5 the three, three, that Tony White's bringing in. Is, I mean, you're going to need guys uh, that are versatile where you don't necessarily have to make a ton of substitutions. Somebody who can uh, you know, hang against the defensive lineman, stop the run, but can also drop back and, and maybe uh, – drop into coverage with a, with a tight end or someone like that. And Lenhart has those sort of measurables. Reminds me a little bit of Caleb Tanner, I think, in terms of athleticism and body type and that sort of thing. Um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how that position develops for Nebraska because you, you look at the attrition they've had with Tanner and, and Mathis and Garrett Nelson – turning pro, I mean, right now your most uh, experienced edges are guys who had reserve roles last year, like Jamari Butler and Blaze Gunnarsson. So I don't know that uh, they're necessarily done addressing that position. Maybe Len Hart's a guy who can come in and, and make an impact right away the way that Caleb Tanner did back in 2018. Um, but, but those are guys that you just can't get enough of, right? Like you, there are certain positions – uh, that, you, that if you, you can find a good player at that spot, you're going to take. And pass rusher is always one of those. And I think the other thing about his recruitment specifically is it's another example of Matt Rule and company really uh, being able to build a relationship quickly and close with guys that they identify. I mean, again, Lenhart decommitted back when all the – the, the transition was going on with Nebraska and had offers elsewhere, like you detailed. He could have gone to a lot of different schools. But ultimately, uh, you know, Matt Rule and company stuck with him. Uh, he, he trusted them. He obviously was impressed enough with Nebraska, uh, the place, as much as the staff. And they get him back in the boat. And, yeah, it's, it's absolutely a major major signing and, and probably one that will go a little bit overlooked um, after the bulk of the class was sort of celebrated last month for him to come in. He seems like a guy, uh, based on his own merits and based on the, the needs of the team, that could be a, an impact player sooner than later. It's Evan Bland with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Evan, when you talk about how Linhart fits into the three three five, I want to take a second and go back to, I mean, the three three five this past weekend against Big Ten foes because it did pretty well. Syracuse did a pretty good job balling up Minnesota's rushing attack. Michigan didn't run the ball with the same success that we've seen all year long, at least not in the first half. They got it going a little bit in the second half. And then Illinois against Mississippi State, their rushing game was atrocious against Mississippi State. All three of those teams, three three five. Did that give you some confidence with the three three five moving forward? Well, I think it's an interesting example. And the Michigan one uh, against TCU, to me, stood out because of the comments afterwards from Michigan's side saying that that was the sort of alignment that they really hadn't seen much of during the year. And we saw how that affected their play calling on offense, especially in goal line situations where you just expect Michigan to pound the ball and to uh, assert its will to get across the goal line there. And they were, you know, doing some different funky things and misdirection. I think that's absolutely a sign of a team that is a little unsure of what it's doing or, or certainly doesn't have the the mentality of, uh, of being a confident favorite, that sort of thing. So, it is interesting, and it's not to say that Nebraska can be TCU's defense right away. I mean, they have a, they have a lot of ballers, a lot of explosion, and I think their scheme maybe will be a little bit different than what Tony White will run at Nebraska. But, um, you know, again, I think it places a premium on guys who are versatile. So you think of guys like, you know, Javen Wright or Isaac Gifford, um, you know, the guys who you feel comfortable with in coverage or – coming into the box and making a tackle. And so I think, too, you look at some of the players that they've 
uh, recruited, I think you can make an argument that a lot of them are coming in with an eye toward some of that versatility that we're talking about. I mean, they took a chance on a guy like Vincent Carroll Jackson, who's a really raw, toolsy defensive lineman. Um, you, you know, the, the junior uh, junior college edition, Kai Wallen, is somebody who can sort of play that D end or, or outside linebacker spot. So uh, I think the, the name of the game is, is versatility. And then, um, you know, the challenge for opponents then, as we've seen in those games that you're detailing, is you just don't know where the pressure is always going to come from. It's not your traditional sort of 4-3 set where you, you can kind of see, you know, what different defenders are doing. You might see – a linebacker blitz, you might see it come from the secondary. Um, some of these players, they, they sort of uh, line up on similar levels, so you don't necessarily know who's who and who and, and where people are coming from. So it's it's just something different for people to prepare for. And I think, um, you know, just that alone can be valuable. And then you add, again, some talented playmakers the way Nebraska appears to be recruiting. Um, and it's the just the sort of change of pace that can be pretty effective. Evan Bland with us. A few minutes here. Hail Varsity Radio. Evan, uh, two names that we're hearing and, and you're hearing uh, for Nebraska to round out their staff. Rob uh, Dvorak at linebacker. He's the backers coach with Carolina. And then Garrett McGuire, son of uh, Tex coach, uh, 24-year-old, likely the wide receivers coach. Does that, does that shock you, 24-year-old coming in? I think he's still uh, he's still 23. I think he turns 24 next month. But yeah, it's uh, so I jumped the gun on him. My fault. <laughs> no, it's all good. I mean, like I think what I was doing at 23 uh, was not being the you know an assistant for a Power <laughs> Five was, program. Yeah. Certainly, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting because we've talked and I've thought a lot about the conviction that Matt Rule has with his vision, and we've seen that in recruiting how they've gone after some sort of under the radar prospects and I think you see that with his staff too and this is not unprecedented by the way you look at his history uh, in 10 years as a head coach he has given many guys their career breaks and they have many of them have gone on to some pretty good success there's a guy by the name of Fran Brown who's the DB's coach at Georgia who who rule hired hired at Temple Uh, Elijah Robinson was another guy that he gave a big break to as a young 20 something at Temple now he's one of the top paid defensive line coaches at Texas A&M um, you know, you mentioned Joey McGuire, who Rule hired out of the Texas high school coaching ranks. Now he's the head coach at Texas Tech. And so I think it, it continues sort of this, this idea that Rule has, um, you know, certain traits he looks for in coaches. He wants them to be moldable. He wants them to be uh, totally bought into his vision. And you talk about a guy like Garrett McGuire, um, you know, who, who knows how that'll turn out, right? You, you've seen a lot of examples thrown out there uh, reminding that Lincoln Riley was uh, about the same age as a receivers coach when he really started his career in earnest. Uh, Charlie Weiss Jr. is another example, or Lane Kiffin were young 20-somethings too. So it's possible that he could end up like that. Um, I, I think in the short term, it'll be interesting to see how Nebraska balances that because – you know, again, how how do you sell that on the recruiting trail to a, you know, a wide receiver that, that your position coach is is going to be, you know, 24. He was a, a backup quarterback at Baylor, um, and and maybe he is a great football mind. But it, it'll be an interesting transition to see how that goes. So I, I think even though there's potential for long term success, uh, Nebraska is going to have to be intentional in the short term, um, you, you know, to, to, to get guys on board with the vision with somebody who's who's so much outside the box in terms of age on that kind of hire. Now, I should note that just from my experience going to high school camps and whatnot, 24 seems a lot older to an 18-year-old than it does to somebody who's, <laughs> say, 25 and up. But oh. the portal. <laughs> <laughs> That's even, true. Even things or, uh, or when your starting quarterback is older than your wide receiver yeah, coach. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Evan, we'll wrap with this. 2023 is here. And your level of optimism with Nebraska football, uh, most Americans per a uh, MSN poll are optimistic about the year. Uh, When we talk about football and what's been inherited by rule versus the build, how's that mesh going to work? A a year from now, are we talking about a bowl victory or at least a bowl appearance? Um, Yeah, I I think so. I mean, I think that's where the conversation starts. Uh, You know, you look at Matt Rule's, record track record in his first year and at, at temple and baylor it wasn't pretty I and mean, i think they won you know one game two games uh but those programs were coming from i think a lot different spaces than where nebraska is now i mean 
Temple was not wasn't all that many years removed from almost being shut down as a football program. Uh, of course, Baylor coming off of the the, the you know the, the the sexual misconduct and all of the um, you know fallout from that. So Nebraska, yeah, they haven't made a bowl game since 2016, but the, the fan supports there, the NIL supports there, the infrastructure's there. This should not be a situation where Nebraska is winning two or three games next year, in my opinion. Um, you know, you look at the roster reset that they already are well underway with. With 30, they're going to end up with 30 plus new bodies, new faces here uh, next year. And, and I think some of the players they have coming back um, add to that optimism, whether that's Casey Thompson or Anthony Grant or AJ Allen, uh, you know, at the running back spots, Quentin Newsom today. Um, you know, signing with the, the Nebraska collective to stick around. I think it was not a given that he would be back um, for a fifth year at corner. So, you know, there, I think there are uh, there is a healthy blend of, of guys coming back who you feel pretty good about continuing to be contributors. Um, and, and then you look at some of the transfers, whether that's Ben Sims at center, uh, or I'm sorry, Ben Scott at center, or Jeff Sims at quarterback, um, so on and so forth. Like, it just feels like. They're going to have the horses, and to me, the big question becomes how quickly does this staff adjust to the Big Ten and the bear that that is? Because we saw in the Frost era that that adjustment came slowly in a lot of ways and and really not at all in some other ways. And so um, if you can adjust to sort of the the slow it down uh, in the trenches, clock management, protect your defense style of play, if you can, uh, you know, evolve into that quickly – then I think absolutely Nebraska has the the horses to be able to be in the conversation for six wins. Um, I, I just I don't see a scenario where they win, you know, three or four games next year just based on on what we've seen so far in the off season. Evan, good to get caught up in the new year. Thanks for a few minutes today. Thanks, guys. Happy New Year. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back in, it's Hail Varsity Radio presented by Currency Time for another Jock Doc Wednesday as we welcome in Dr. Brandon Seifert from Nebraska Orthopedic Center, a Jock Doc Wednesday. And Dr. Brandon, how are you doing following the, the Christmas holiday, the New Year's holiday, getting back into the flow of things at work? How are you doing today? Well, I'm great, buddy. I'm happy to be back, uh, kind of going here. We just had our first day back in the office today, so it's good to be back good to be going how about you how was the holidays for you well it's a weird combination it's our first day back today as well and it's a weird combination of the break in the middle of it it felt too long i was ready to get back but then whenever i woke up this morning i said oh i could have gone a couple more days <laughs> uh, that's good stuff buddy absolutely well dr brandon big big story on monday night football as uh, scary moments on the field between the Bills and the Bengals as uh, Hamlin, the defensive back from the Bills, took a shot to the chest, stood up briefly, went down onto the field. Uh, sounds like his heart was stopped on the field, and then uh, he was brought back by team personnel. And uh, Dr. Brady, your reaction watching that injury? Yeah, you know, obviously an extremely scary uh, scenario that happens there. The biggest fear of somebody who does stand on a lot of sidelines is something like that happening, you know, fortunately super rare. Um, you know, you start to run the scenarios through your mind about what could have happened there, what leads to something, you know, terrible like that. Um, you know, I haven't heard any updates today, but I hope that young man is, is recovering and, and doing well, but I haven't heard anything about it today, at least from an update perspective. So as you look at that, um, obviously very traumatic. It's really traumatic for the players in the field, but you really have to commend the EMS staff and the sports med staff. They were right on top of it and were able to get chest compressions going right away and and really save save that gentleman's life most likely. Um, I know there's going to be people out there maybe trying to criticize the whole scenario of this, but they did an amazing job. So I think that's important to note that. Um, as we kind of dive into this and start asking questions, of course, there's a lot of speculation out there in terms of what exactly happened. Uh, they haven't said specifically yet, at least I haven't seen any updates to indicate that. Some things that kind of come forth uh, with this type of uh, injury, this type of uh, event happening, probably the one that rises to the top of the list, the things that we always try to screen for early in the season, a big term out there is called heterotopic uh, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is essentially an enlargement of the uh, muscular wall of the heart um, over time in our athletes that can lead to what we call dysrhythmia, dysrhythmias, where essentially the heart doesn't beat right. There's a thing called ventricular fibrillation, where the heart is not beating right, it's not pumping blood out, it kind of doesn't have its appropriate electrical signals, 
as a result of that, you can go into cardiac arrest, which could have been a scenario here. I don't know that. Um, at that level, usually you would have found that by now. There's a lot of preseason testing that's done to look for that. Um, but that would be something that you see most commonly in, you know, sudden death in athletes that have a you know, cardiac arrest on the basketball court or playing football. could be from that. The other thing that's been thrown around is, you know, before this happened, you know, he took a direct blow to the chest. Um, there's a term out there called commotio cordis, which is basically Latin for agitation of the heart. Um, you hear this more in our younger athletes who take, like, a direct blow to the chest. The young baseball player takes a baseball to the chest and they go into cardiac arrest. Just like it says in Latin, it's essentially any type of irritation to the heart that would cause what we call a dysrhythmia, where it changes the rhythm, basically gets into ventricular fibrillation where you're no longer, your heart's no longer beating, and then you go into cardiac arrest. Those would be kind of the two biggest things that would kind of come to the top of the list in this scenario, you know, causing a cardiac arrest like that on the field. And so those would be the two things I would kind of lean towards as a possible diagnosis. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us here at Jock Doc Wednesday talking to the Bills. DeMar Hamlin, that scary scene on Monday night. Hamlin still in critical care uh, at a local hospital in Cincinnati. And Dr. Brandon, quickly, let, let's get into what actually goes down on the field in a situation like this because he, he was down on the field for a while. It was a scary moment as uh, the, the Bills and Bengals players were praying together. Uh, it was a, a really a terrifying scene. And I want to get into what's actually happening down on the field. I know he was receiving CPR for nine minutes or, or somewhere around that mark. And I also was assuming there were probably some, some pads being cut off, the, the helmet being taken off. And I just want to get into what's actually happening in this situation with team personnel as, as Hamlin's down on the field and they're trying to bring him back. Yeah, and so, you know, your first thing, you see a guy go down, Looks like it's a scenario where he's he's gone unconscious at that point. Um, interesting scenario as you're assessing that very quickly. A guy stands up, looks pretty good, all of a sudden just falls back over. You start to think about you know something cardiopulmonary, a heart or lung issue that would result in something like that. Usually, if you're going to have you know some type of impact concussion injury, you just stay down on the field. So already, as you're running out of the field, that's going through your mind. As you get out there, you do your quick assessment, try to get any kind of response out of the athlete. If they're not responding to you, then obviously you go quickly to your, you know, ABCs, every breathing circulation, so you're going to feel for a pulse, you know, put your ear down to see if there's any breathing, obviously you're going to try to stimulate the athlete, and then from that point out, if you're not getting anything going, you can't feel the pulse, then you jump right into doing the chest compressions, and then from there, fortunately, you've got EMS, you want to basically wave them on the field almost immediately, so they come out and have all of their equipment, so you can hook them up to what we call an AED with a defibrillator machine. And that, those typically have a, a, a rhythm strip on there. You can kind of read what's going on with the heart at that point. But all the while, you're starting your chest compressions to at least try to get some blood flowing. And then once you get your pads on, now you've got your EMS people there. You've got your EKG or at least a rhythm strip. You can see what's going on with the uh, myocardium. And then at that point, you can decide if shocks need to be administered. And obviously, if you have an AED there, that's going to deliver better shocks and better compressions, essentially, than, or give you a better outcome than if it's just alone and so that's what they're doing and then once you kind of get those going he's hooked up you got your monitors all set to go then at that point you want to start thinking about putting in you know airway management so you start to slip in like we call it, endotracheal tube to control you know breathing and then from there you're on a stretcher you're in the ambulance and you're trying to get to an emergency facility as quickly as possible for other uh, life-saving measures and that's how that basically scenario should go in a you know, perfect scenario dr brandon seifert's with us here a jock doc wednesday Dr. Brandon, where does this, this medical discussion go now for DeMar Hamlin? Still in critical condition, a couple days removed from the incident. Still sounds like he's on an, some sort of a, a ventilator, though he has been breathing under his own power, it sounds like, uh, which confused me a little bit. But I just want to get your take on where uh, the, the medical discussion goes now surrounding his health. Yeah, and so at this point, the, the big unknowns are, so you know, what happens if you know, the heart's not working? Well, you're not getting blood to your brain, so basically the brain becomes oxygen-starved. And then at that point, you know, if, if your brain cells, any cells nearby for men are not getting blood or oxygen, they start to die. And so the big question is going to be how much damage was done, you know, to his brain. And then from there, trying to figure out how much damage is done is basically going to be a process here over the next couple of days as they start to withdraw some of those supportive measures. Um, so, for example, you just mentioned that he's able to breathe on his own. Well, that's good. That indicates, you know, a certain type of brain function is still there. Um, and then you'll maybe start to turn off some of the sedation to see what kind of things can he do. Um, can his body start to support itself as you start to pull away different modalities that you're using to whether it's you know, blood pressure support or you know, ventilatory support. You start to pull those things back. 
and see what the what the patient's going to show you in terms of things they can do. And as they start to gain more of that control back, and you just keep pulling them further back, eventually to the point where the patient's doing the stuff on their own, and obviously the you know, the intertracheal tube can come out and they can start breathing on their own. Um, and so that'll be the process for the next couple of days. Um, sometimes with these types of injuries, if there has been maybe a significant injury to the brain, then they may have to, you know, control some brain swelling. You can have some brain swelling as a result of that, and so that might slow down this process of kind of pulling away some of those measures. Um, and that'll basically be, unfortunately, there's there's no way to know that until you essentially start to pull those things away and kind of it's a self-discovery process in terms of what kind of damage has been done. It's really hard to predict where he'll be. Hopefully, he'll end up with some really good function, um, but it's hard to say at this point. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us here at Jock Doc Wednesday. And Dr. Brandon, thank you for the insight today. Have fun uh, with this week getting back to work and getting back in the rhythm of things, all right? Okay, Elijah, you take care, buddy. Have a great week. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time, back with you on a Wednesday to kick off 2023 after a uh, delayed vacation yesterday. Uh, full bore as we move forward. Plenty of college football the rest of this week. Uh, basketball on our mind. And, of course, uh, plenty of insight. Brennan's all fired up for uh, North Dakota State versus South Dakota State. That'll be awesome. On Saturday, Bob chimed in earlier on uh, 2023 expectations. And it kind of stems from the MSN poll that is out there. Most Americans are optimistic, just Hey, I think 2023 is going to be a great year, 53 to 47 percent, uh, give or take a percentage here and there. Uh, Bob is like, look, six is the bottom uh, as far as wins go. Eight is the ceiling in year one. Bob, I think a lot of Nebraska fans would be uh, right in that sweet spot with you. And it's OK. Uh, you, you finish up strong with recruiting. Matt Schick front and center, of course. Yesterday down in Orlando with the hat show for a couple of wins for Nebraska, uh, for the hearts and minds in PR. And now you think, here's your starting point. And we had a good discussion today. Where is that starting point in retrospect to past new coaching hires and regimes? I think it's as good as it's been since Bo took over. You You had Callahan's. High-level recruits, Bo got a hold of them, and you looked at what happened. I don't, I don't subscribe 29, to the 2009, notion. 2008, 2009 were pretty good years. I don't subscribe to the notion, though, that, that Scott Frost was as bare as we thought at the time. Now, looking back with some of the talent, he had a couple all Big Ten-type players on his roster as well when he started out. And I, oh, I think yeah, the, the big Hymas, change, yeah. I mean, Hymas, you had Stanley Morgan, you had mm-hmm. J.D. Spielman. You, you had guys... The defense was a bit of a, an exception, but I think Lamar Jackson at the time could have been considered a guy who had potential to, have, to well, be an all-big-time guy. Well, but you also were able to keep a guy like Stilly mm-hmm. and uh, JoJo Doman were, were guys you inherited. And that's what I'm saying. I don't think the cupboard was as bare for Scott Frost as we seem to no, think I at think the time. They, I think they recruited pretty decently, mm-hmm. and then you lost some guys once once guy no it, it it's it's it, it, it's all a mesh point yeah exactly it comes down to getting your team to, to mesh together and to have your system mesh so with they the rest buy of the into big you. Of time exactly exactly so it, it is easy right now to say well six is the ceiling eight's the floor i don't necessarily agree with that a lot can change between now and august and i guess also within the coaching staff they can learn a lot about this team and about themselves between now and august so to have that small of margins within your, your ceiling and floor, I think is a little early to say, but I, I get behind the general idea behind it that talent wise. Yes. I think this team has more than enough to get six wins. Uh, and I think whenever you take into account the fact that it is going to be a new coaching staff and, and there is going to be some meshing that needs to be done. Eight's a, eight's a fair ceiling, but I think it's way too early to try to put a number that small on this team. They, they have, they should not have dipped below six in the last two regimes mm-hmm. at worst they should have been 500 mm-hmm. both both um regimes underachieved you had the one nine and four under riley and then you just had missed opportunity after missed opportunity a couple of years there were some just brutal schedules 
But you, you also played some of your most competitive football in that mother of all schedules post-COVID year. Tomorrow, Gary Barnett, Brandon Vogel, Mitch Sherman. We'll talk to you at four with Hale Varsity, presented by Currency. Thanks.